Um, so we're going to move on to the testimonials that we have um, to celebrate, help us celebrate and mark and inform about the 20 years that have gone um, since the founding workshop in the Chateau de Bossy, Bossé, and that was together with uh, Heidi Hadsell, who helped to host that very occasion. And she um, was then a member of the association board, then a member of the board of foundation, and she's now a, a pool of expert, experts member and contributing in so many ways. We're very proud and happy to welcome her to the stage. Thank you. So, so be careful, 20 years goes very quickly. <laughs> My task today is to talk very briefly, Lucy gave me five minutes, I think, um, about the first meeting of the Board of Globe Ethics. Before I do that, however, I want you all to get a real sense of how this emerging organization, Globe Ethics, was really something to celebrate at a time when our um, religions and our academic communities and other kinds of communities were in their own, own corners and their own silos, not doing much together. Here was an international, multidisciplinary, secular and interreligious organi organization focused on real issues, concerns and activities in such a way that the ethics and values of communities worldwide were integral to the conversation. Um, seeing all of them as a major strength of us thinking and working together and not, as was often the case back then, as an impediment to rational conversation, religion as an impediment to rational conversation and thus something to be marginalized and excluded. This was for a number of us, including me, uh, uh, internationally oriented ethics professor and leader of a graduate school of, of ethics and religion in the United States. This was for me and others almost too good to be true. And yet there was Christoph with his international experience and networks, his deeply rooted value orientation building an international organization centered on the very things that many international organizations went to great lengths to exclude, values. Thank you, Christoph. Thank you now and thank you from way back then in, ad in addition to me, and we all thank you for that vision and that, that um, work. And now for the board. I could not locate my files with minutes and names. Um, I remember, however, how exciting it was to begin to interact as a board and to get to know and to think together with the folks around us, including Walter. <laughs> Hello, nice to see you. I, um, but I do know we began early um, on very early on, a substantive conversation about our shared awareness that often those community, communities most marginalized from wider conversations were in part marginalized because they lacked the tools or the access to the tools to bring them more fully into wider conversations. And we concluded that the tools they lacked at this time were often concrete material things like good libraries uh, that they could reach and use with books and magazines and so forth. And also they lacked access to the still emerging electronic world as well. Thus the focus of those board in that early time, in those early years was, if I remember correctly, around ways to increase access to knowledge and information in little and big ways, including importantly, the digitization of countless volumes, um, ethics volumes and volumes related to ethics. 
um, uh, so that that um, we could we could help in the shaping of their lives, or they could help themselves, these communities, in the shaping of their lives and communities in ways that made sense to them, and also so they could be fully part of wider conversations, such as those Globe Ethics was inviting them into. Many things, including perhaps implementation or imp perhaps information technologies have changed over these 20 years. And access to information is not the same issue as it was, although of course it is still an issue. I can't help but note our sessions today on AI and underline the fact that Globe Ethics is nimble and does a wonderful job thinking in fresh ways about new things like, like technologies changing and changes accordingly. As we think about the AI sessions that we had today, undoubtedly, we will begin to ask ourselves what barriers and challenges AI may contain that may potentially marginalize communities, um, such as we did when we were thinking about books and digitalization of books and access to books and other such issues. Um, um, and when the time comes, I am sure Globe Ethics will be ready to think about and tackle those questions. Um, and uh, with that, I will conclude. I think I'm under five and uh, thank Christoph again for his wonderful, wonderful leadership and creativity and um, uh, the joy that you brought to your work too, that you bring to all of us. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm going to invite now our board member, vice president um, and pool of experts member and many other hats, um, Divya Singh to come and speak. Thank you. Good afternoon. Today we've been speaking a lot about words like this afternoon, we said celebration. We've spoken about peace and we've spoken about ethics. And with those three words, the inevitable fourth word has to be hope. And if ever a country epitomized the spirit of hope, it was South Africa, my home. From the darkness of apartheid, South Africa made the transition to democracy in peace and with optimism, with no bloodshed and in a spirit of reconciliation. Like the rest of the world amidst our good days, we have our bad days, our worst days and our absolutely abysmal days where unethical conduct, crime and violence are the only things about which we speak. But we go to bed at night and when we wake up, we wake up smiling because we have a beautiful country. And in Globe Ethics, I see that same ethos. I joined the organization in 2014 after a meeting with Christoph in South Africa. And Liesel is here, and I'm not sure if you know that Dion Rousseau from the Ethics Institute was actually the facilitator of that meeting. I joined as an institutional member of the University of South Africa. But in joining Globe Ethics, I was absorbed into an energizing culture of positivity with so many people who truly believed in the importance of ethics for a better world. And I emphasize this belief because so often we all talk the talk, but we don't all walk the talk. In Globe Ethics, I found people who walked the talk. I can still vividly recall the strategy session in 2016, 
when at a forum much like this one, we agreed on ethics in higher education as the strategic focus area for the next period. And I look at Obiora nodding at me. You were there. You were the president at that time, Obiora. And personally, I was ecstatic when that became the strategy because I truly embraced the wisdom of our president, Nelson Mandela, who said, education is the strongest weapon that you can use to change the world. From 2016, Globe Ethics has made significant inroads into the higher education landscape, engaging with all role players, from ministries to vice chancellors, but most importantly, the students sharing the values of ethical social responsibility as a key graduate attribute. The university as an incubator for future leadership is a fact. So if the message is understood by the student cohort, I believe that there is so much hope for the future. We do not live in a homogenous world and the disruptions wrought by violence, wrought by inequality and now technology should never be underestimated. I am therefore reassured whenever I read the 2027 Global Ethics Strategy and Commitment, which states the role that Globe Ethics will play is in, in enabling a better world. It will be the role of Globe Ethics to provide the necessary guidance for organizations and leaders to take responsible, informed, and courageous decisions. Ladies and gentlemen, the courage to be different, the courage to make a difference is what will be critical as we look to a world with integrity. And so my big question is, when you look in the mirror, do you see a courageous leader? To all of us in the Globe Ethics family, I want to say congratulations on the last 20 years. We've been phenomenal. And I look forward to the next 20 years and the contributions that I know we will make. Congratulations. Divya, thank you. Uh, we're all waking up in the morning smiling and now we know why. There we go, peace, hope. Bringing it all. So now I invite our, our Vice President, Dicky Sofian, scholar, Professor, Muslim scholar, to say a few words. Thank you. <clears throat> Bismillah rahman rahim In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon you all. Um, my first brush and engagement with uh, Globe Ethics probably came around maybe 2011 or 2012. And that was when I met Christoph in Yogyakarta. You know, he would uh, frequent our center, which is the Indonesian Consortium for Religious Studies uh, under the um, house of the Graduate School of Universitas Gajamada. Um, at the time I was this, this little known and uh, you know, young and restless academic, just transitioning from an international, you know, career in NGOs and just you know coming into academia and and starting to become a, a professor. Um, of course, I'm now a lot older and still unknown, and even more restless. <laughs> You know, given the current human condition and also the situation of this, you know, dizzying world. And of course, Christoph was a lot more younger, but seems that uh, he's a lot more restless <laughs> now ever than before, you know. 
but I was always respectful of uh, Christoph. You know, um, he was always, it was, you know, he's, he's a nice gentleman. And he's always respectful to, you know, cultures and different uh, religions and communities. You know, my father, who was um, a linguist turned diplomat, you know, once said, Dickie, it's nice to be important, but the important thing is to be nice. And I think that sort of uh, is, is a thing that, that to me you know, resonates with um, Christoph and his sort of ways in which he strategized to expand the organization worldwide. And during that time, the Indonesian Consortium for Religious Studies had already set up and hosted the Globe Ethics Indonesia office where we had Professor Siti Shamsiatun from the Islamic University becoming the director of Globe Ethics uh, Indonesia. And as I recall, Globe Ethics at the time was still sort of building up its online resources and library. And there were a lot of uh, Indonesian academics who were interested in publishing with Globe Ethics. And we published in Indonesian, in English, in Arabic. And in fact, we translated the books into English, into Indonesian, and also into uh, Arabic and vice versa. And, um, you know, I was told that one of, or some of the most downloaded books actually are from Indonesia. And um, one of the most countries with the most participants or members in the Global Ethics Network comes from Indonesia. So um, I can sort of, um, I probably have three plausible explanation why this could be happening. One is Indonesia, you know, just with its sheer number of people, you know, the size of Indonesia um, and its, you know, dynamic population, young population. Um, you know, we have a lot of universities, higher education institutions, even in my city of Yogyakarta, which is sort of the Boston of Indonesia. Um, has a lot of universities and higher education institution. My university, Gajamada University, has 68,000 students, 2,500 professors and lecturers, uh, all in one institution. And so the sheer number of, uh, you know, people, faculty members and students uh, just sort of, you know, um, generates this interest. Uh, secondly, um, you know, Indonesia is considered as the most religious country in the world. You know, we have 98% of people believing in God. And obviously most of us are uh, Muslims and therefore ethics and more specifically religious ethics is sort of, you know, second nature to us. You know, we think about ethics all the time. But thirdly, despite the level of religiosity, Indonesia is also known as one of the most corrupt countries. And so you do find this sort of contradiction yeah. So on the one hand, you know, we are the most religious uh, country in the world. But then on the other hand, we are perhaps one of the most uh, corrupt countries in the world. So this is where I think ethics comes in, where it could bridge the understanding about religion and the practice of everyday governance. And lastly, of course, uh, through my own observation, I see a lot of you know, this ethical deficit in many of the realms of society, the politics of society, the economics of business, the investments, and so on and so forth. And I think this is where um, Globe Ethics can come in, you know, to sort of help countries like Indonesia to go and to transcend beyond all of these uh, social ills. Lastly, I'd just like to say, you know, after publishing about, I think, four books and uh, numerous articles in various edited volumes of Globe Ethics, you know, I was offered a uh, pro bono job in Globe Ethics as, uh, you know, member of the pool of expert in 2000, I think late 2018. Um, and then, uh, as if that was not enough, you know, I, I was, you know, asked to become a member of the International Board of the Foundation in 2021. And then when Fadi came, um, oh, Obiora first, you know, he then appointed me as director for the Globe Ethics Indonesia. And then when Fadi came, 
He said, no, no, you're not the director. You are the regional consul of the Asia Pacific uh, region. I said, amazing, you know, <laughs> I have so many hats in globe ethics. And now I'm the vice president of globe ethics. So, you know, Fadi, you could be the executive director, but I have like five titles under my belt, you know? <laughs> You know, and, and this is quite funny because I'm not an ethicist. You know, I, I was trained as a political scientist. I learned politics for about 16 years, although my focus was mostly on Muslim politics. But, you know, Aristotle once said that uh, politics is actually the manifestation of ethics in society. You know, so uh, this is where I think I'm coming from. So um, with this 20th anniversary, I sincerely hope that, you know, we can continue to carry the good work that we have been doing. I think we are making um, good changes and transformations in different parts of the world. And I sincerely hope that, you know, we all could be a part of this process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dickie. We're traveling around the world and we're getting insights into where the inspiration is coming from um, and the call, repeated call, to make the change where we are. Um, moving now to Switzerland, um, I'm inviting Isabel Sommer to come to the stage. She's also a board member um, on behalf, standing there on behalf of the Lindsay Foundation. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon to all of you. When Walter Lindsay and his wife Ursula, who are here with us today, when they decided to put most of their shares they received from the enterprise Belimo to establish the Lindsay Foundation, their main aim was to create positive social impact in the world. Their vision on which they founded the Lindsay Foundation was a more just world in which all human beings can live a self-determined life in dignity and security. As having the privilege of working at the Lindsay Foundation, we act and engage ourselves consciously with high moral standards and a humble attitude knowing that doing good is not a simple choice, where we can always be assured to be on the right path. An ethical approach, considering different aspects of doing good is key in our everyday work. As an independent charitable foundation, we apply our significant level of liberties with an equally ambitious level of responsibility and we are grounded in shared virtues of honesty, fairness, and integrity. During the past years, the Lindsay Foundation has supported Globe Ethics, a cooperation that started on a coincidental meeting between Walter and Ursula Lindsay with Christoph in Bern. And we are convinced as the Lindsay Foundation that we are working on the same issues as Globe Ethics to bring in more justice and fairness in the world, which is so desperately needed. This belief in human potential and the transformative power of good behavior in all layers of society drives our common passion and commitment. Supporting an organization that is passionate do you still hear me? Yes. Or shall I just talk louder? Is it okay? Supporting an organization that is passionate about what they do and that cares about bringing positive changes in the world has been an inspiration. So this development, it needs reliable partners. We realize that people's opportunities and freedoms are shrinking around the world. Minorities are more and more under pressure and autocratic regimes are on the rise. Radical political parties are gaining momentum. 
the room for maneuver of civil society and its organizations is becoming increasingly restricted. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yes, it so, almost so seems problem, as if right. democratic societies committed yeah, you know, to human rights are becoming an obsolete no model. So, so this must not true. be allowed to happen. The Lindsay Foundation sees itself as a force that courageously opposes this development by enabling civil space and freedom. With development projects in the area of education, health and social justice in India and Eastern Africa, the Lindsay Foundation works with a clear goal to create a culture of integrity transparency and peace in our target groups, but also in our partner organizations we're working with. Thus, in a certain sense, we also strive for an ethical, reflected behavior among human beings to make this world a little bit more human. Away from the spotlight, we often see in our work positive developments when we visit our partners. For example, when women courageously raise their voices to demand their rights or rights for minorities. This keeps us motivated in our work. To conclude, Christoph, Fadi and his team have set high standards for global ethics. In this complex world in which ethic plays an important role in order to find a common understanding about what doing good means to various people coming from different contexts and different backgrounds. Our results should also be made visible in practice. This is important for the work of Globe Ethics and also for us. We really thank Christoph for his dedication and his commitment and his whole heart he put in the work with Globe Ethics. And we wish the new president, Professor Dietrich Werner, Fadi and his team, continued success and the best possible impact. Thank you. Testing, it's okay. okay. I think we're good. So thank you very much, Isabel, for your intervention and for your testimony, and also for the modeling of when times get tough, we keep going. So thank you for that. And yeah. now an impromptu intervention. <laughs> thank you, Rita. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. I know we are no program point, but we would like to still share a few thoughts and words with you. And we is Walter and me for you, Christoph, and that's why we're here for, to celebrate 20 years of togetherness. I think start working together and um, it was a long journey, very interesting journey. And um, I think we had a very good time together. We were, work, we were working hard, but um, it was our wish to come here to, to be with you when, when, when big things happen in your life now or a big change happens. So um, we have prepared something for you. Um, the, the reason or the idea behind this now that you are um, kind of retired, but I don't believe right now, but still um, window opens, a new window opens. It gives you a new site. Maybe you can... Um, uh, tackle new projects, but with this book, we have an invitation for you. We would like a, to open a window to a valley in Switzerland, which is called Val Lumnetia, which means um, Valley of the Light. You were always the light of many people with your work, Christoph, and I think this we would like to um, honor. And we would like, we you know that you, you also sing. Um, and we sing in a big choir, and this choir meets every year once. And we would like to invite you and Suzanne, if you want to come too, 
we would like to invite you in the Val Lumnezia and that you get a kind of idea what expects you there. Um, we have made a book from this year's um, um, choir week. So thank you very much for everything. It was really a very good way together. And thank you for everything. It was such a big joy to see what happened, what, how this child, Globethics, grew. And really, we are very much impressed. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was a beautiful moment. Um, I'm going to invite um, the mayor of Grand Saconé, Mr. Laurent uh, Dumaja, to say a few words to us. Um, we called it an endorsement. Um, so we're very proud to welcome you. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Good afternoon. I plan to speak in French, but uh, they said it would be better to speak in English. So I try to, to speak. If you don't understand, you can see, you can read my paper with, uh, later, okay? Because of the accent. <laughs> I would like to sincerely uh, thank the organizers of this event for their invitation. The authorities of Kansakane, which I represent, are convinced of the readiness of your approach. And it, uh, it is for this reason that I come to offer our support. I not only have the pride to, of speaking before you, but also and especially of representing the municipality that is home of the headquarters of global ethics here in Switzerland in Europe and many other organizations also, as well as numerous diplomatic missions. If you don't know Grand Sacone, when you are at the airport, you, you know that uh, uh, the major part of the airport is in Grand Sacone. As far back or as one can look, it is evident that most of the conflicts we observe in uh, workplaces within countries or between nations are the result of misunderstandings at times, but more often they stem from the absence of common values, share and share values. This forum is certainly a place where you have discussed this extensively. So I'm not an uh, expert in that, you are the expert. Imagine a world where wars can be avoided through shared ethical principles. Too often conflicts arise from the pursuit of power, money, and resources. If we had a clear ethical framework based on mutual respect and justice, we could reduce tensions and avoid unnecessary wars that cost lives and precious resources. Conflicts in Syria, Ukraine, or Yemen, for example, might have been avoided if strong ethical commitment were in place to resolve disputes through dialogue rather, rather than violence. It is essential to recognize that the riches of our, of our planet are equally, equitably uh, distributed, inequitably distributed. A minimum ethical code could establish mechanisms to exchange and fairly redistribute wealth, ensuring that everyone has access to the basics of a dignified life. Poverty and uh, inequality, inequality are not inevitabilities. They often result from political and economic uh, decisions that favor a minority at the expense of the most vulnerable. But adopting an ethical code, we could begin to correct these imbalances and build a future where everyone has a place. 
Moreover, the absence of corruption and injust injustice in another fundamental aspect. When leaders abuse their power, when resources are diverted to enrich and elight at the expense of the common good, it creates an atmosphere of distrust and despair. A rigorous ethical framework could establish norms of transparency and accountability, allowing every citizen to live in a fair and equitable environment. The, question, the, the quest of moral line that harms no one to is thus more than an aspiration. It is a necessity. We must demand that our government and institutions commit to respecting this ethical code so that we can collectively build a world where peace, justice, and equity are not mere ideals, but lived realities. Some upheaval resulting from a challenge to certain practices could be avoided. Cope, various insurrections, challenges in the central states, etc. Ethics could well, could well replace recourse to religion to combat injustices. It goes without saying that mere declarations in intent are not enough. We must be able to translate them into simple rules that citizens and employees of our administrations must respect. This is the case in the municipality of Grand Sacone where employees must adhere to the same rules as any civil servant, but not accepting gifts over a certain uh, values to avoid becoming dependent on service providers. I think uh, uh, the Canton of Geneva uh, explained that uh, last time. In conclusion, it is more than time to ask. Together we can make our voices heard and demand change. A world where wars are avoided, where, where wealth is equitably redistributed and where corruption and injustice have to no place is within our reach, but it is requires a collective commitment to a minimum ethical code. I hope you understood what I said. Thank you very much. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Thank you, uh, Monsieur Le Maire, for, for your leadership. Thank you for your example, for living the values. So now we've, we come to inviting our president, our founder, to the stage for a, a few words. few words, I was given 20 minutes, so I'll try to uh, stick to that. Thank you very much for all these uh, great words. Um, I start with an explanation where I have this that you see. It's a gift from Indonesia. We heard the, we heard um, Diki from Indonesia and uh, it's a stole from the Sumba Island near to Bali, a weaving of a group of women, of the Indian, uh, indigenous women of the island of Sumba. Most of us may not know where it is, but we know where Bali is. It is a symbol of balance and harmony, mirroring the rhythm of nature, if you look at the the symbols on it. And we will, you will see uh, soon what is the meaning why I'm having it here. Thank you so much from Indonesia and uh, our uh, uh, re regional uh, officer, um, Lakshmi. This is the third and last handover in my 20 years of globe ethics. The first was 2008 when I changed from being the founding president to becoming executive director 
and Ambassador Walter Fust became accepted to be my president. The second was 2016 when I retired as executive director and handed over to Opiora Ike, myself becoming again president just by chance. The third last and last one is now to hand over presidency to the new uh, president, Professor Dietrich Werner. And next Monday, I'm out as honorary president. So uh, I start in my first point with a profound thanks. I could speak half an hour for thanks, but uh, if I look at all of you, it's my biggest thank. So take just one second and shake the hand of your neighbors. So this is... Uh, This is Globe Ethics. We are a community of people. From the colleagues of the founding workshop, and we heard Heidi um, too, and we will hear a musician uh, who is, was then a student. And now among us, we will hear you, Nikos, later or in a minute. To, uh, former and current board members, from the small staff team uh, of only two part-time junior just graduated students because we did not have money for senior people, to a global team on all continents, from the thousands of participants in conferences, workshops, trainings, to teachers and ex experts of our courses, from the hundreds of authors of articles and books in our 350 Globe Ethics books published to uh, the 3.5 million downloads of these uh, 350 books from the 200 institutional partner organizations to academic, private and government sectors from the city and canton of Geneva, thank you again, uh, and Constance to the Swiss national government on their way, always very supportive accompaniment and foundation supervision from the um, active persons to passive users of library, from the many friends, and also my family, especially my wife, Susan, who had to bear many of my absences while I was traveling, as you know, in such a big <laughs> job. I profoundly thank also the former executive director of Yora, Ike, and the current executive director, uh, Professor Fadi Dao, for their impressive, strategic, uh, and strong leadership, and also Deputy um, Executive Director Lucy, you uh, see her in action, and Academic Director Amele Ekwe. Yeah, there. Um, last but not least, I warmly thank Walter and Walter. Walter Fust, ambassador, he was crucial. And just a small uh, indication, it was, I was member of the preparatory committee for the VCs or consultative uh, board of the VCs conference, World Summit for the Information Society. And he was the innovator. Please stand up, Walter. Uh, <laughs> He had the vision to say, how can ICT serve humanity as a service? I was in this preparatory board and that was the eye open to say, we need ICT for ethics in development. That was in fact, 2003, the eye open and trigger for Globe Ethics that I found it then one year later. And uh, with his support, uh, we had no money. I just had an idea. I'm not a millionaire. And uh, so, uh, but then I came on my knee to Walter Fust and said, I have an idea. Can we, can we, can we uh, have an initial startup seed money? And he said, yes, three times 200,000 for the first three years uh, under the one condition, which I knew 
government gives only 50%. So find the other 50%. And then that was the trigger when I met Walter and Ursula Lindsay just by chance or by God's providence uh, in Bern, as mentioned. <laughs> and then, of course, the whole, the whole uh, support by the team, by Rita, by all the others. We heard the word coincidental encounters. And I think that was a trick really to have all the time in these 20 years, people we met by chance. And out of that, something could work. Like Divya, like Diki, like all the others you mentioned, like uh, you in Tunisia, Kamel. And then you said, wow, I want to join you. I want to be part of this movement. My second point, motto and core values. The tagline of my personal website is global values for life, inspire, innovate, integrate. About 10 years ago, I formulated it. And this motto with the triple I, inspire, innovate, and integrate, can also be seen as the motto of Globethrix during the 20 years of existence. Global values or sharing values across borders. I, I was, thanks to uh, uh, you, Fadi, asked to have a short, uh, yeah, in form of interviews, you can have the booklet out that sharing values across, uh, across borders. That is the, I think the core of Globethics, sharing values in a non-imperialistic way. We are brothers and sisters, we are, on an equal level, we share values, we learn from each other across borders. I will come back to that. And now the new global ethics motto is navigating life. It also refers to life, enhancing life, empowering life, uh, sharing life in its positive and suffering side. In addition, the focus of global ethics since day one, and Heidi remembers, was leadership, responsible leadership. We want to address those who are decision makers. And of course, we are all, because self-leadership is the beginning, how to steer ourselves in a responsible way. So it's not only about ministers and diplomats and CEOs, it's about leadership of all of us. The current global ethic core values are justice, peace, dignity, inclusiveness, quality, sustainability, integrity, and responsibility. I just take an example, the including uh, equality of gender. It was since day one, it was a very clear decision when I handpicked 25 people for the founding workshop here in Geneva to have gender balance, have multi-faith, have people from all continents. It is a strategic decision. And if I look here, I counted uh, this afternoon, we have almost gender balance, 50-50. Uh, we have in many countries between 60 and 40 or 40 and 60%. So it's, we are not where we want to be, but still we are ahead of other organizations in terms of gender participation uh, of both uh, um, yeah, uh, parts of humanity. Uh, now, the DNA, what is then the DNA, the core of our organization? And uh, in the 10 years Jubilee 2014, I formulated 10 characteristics, values, partners, inclusion, innovation, networking, service, support, entrepreneurship, governance, and growth. You can read it in uh, also my message of 2014 online. That leads me to my third point. And it was mentioned already by others. Uh, values, many uh, philosophical organizations, uh, every company has a value statement at the beginning, but we add one other point, and that is spirituality. We say we cannot have values, or we can, of course, but spirituality in the multi-faith sense is part of it. 
And many UN organizations say, yeah, yeah, values, yes, yes, but please don't come with religion. So no, how can we do? 80% of humans uh, define themselves as religious. And the UN says, please keep it out of the door. I had harsh discussion with UNESCO in Paris. They said, yeah, we have, no, 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 no religion. I said, that's not normal. Please include it as a natural part of human existence and as an energy source for our value basis. And I remember we have um, in our board meetings also always an opening uh, short reflection. Our, unfortunately, she passed away, a board member from Thailand, she was a Buddhist. When she has the, the, the bowl, you know, with a sound, that was touching the heart. And then we have uh, our Hindu um, board member, Pawan from Delhi, who is chanting a song. I mean, he is a Supreme Court advocate, chanting at the beginning of a meeting. And then we have the Christian prayers, or we have a philosophical uh, 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 opening. Now, a real challenge is to maintain open and ambitious, to, to remain open and at the same time ambitious for new ideas, at the same time focused and modest. So that was always a challenge. We embrace the world, we are open, but at the same time, and thanks, uh, Walter, I mean, you pushed me uh, very strongly, be focused, be focused, be focused. So we need to deal with this uh, openness, welcoming new ideas, and at the same time, no, that's not our task. That's not our task, but here, this is our niche that we do. So uh, I come to my fifth point, handover as a joyful transition in leadership. Uh, no, I... Uh, yeah, um, you can imagine some people uh, said, yeah, I'm not so sure if uh, Christoph will be able to give up. He's so committed. <laughs> you will see, I will give up. <laughs> I have to prove it to you. No, what I, I can say, I'm proud to say I founded about seven organizations, foundations, associations, in the last 40 years, starting as a student with, with a fair tourism organization. And all organizations still exist and still exist without me, from Transparency Switzerland to Fair Trade to several things. So, uh, and if I'm not giving up, please remind me, uh, because becoming older is giving up is not becoming easier, you know but I'm confident uh, about myself. So <laughs> um, now I designed the statutes of Globe Ethics since day one and how do you, remind, you, you remember limitation of mandates, two hours for the board, two years per, for the board, three times renewable, maximum eight years. Then, of course, people came to me and said, yeah, foundation is free to, you can change the, the statutes. Why don't you say 10 years or 12 years? Why eight? I said, no, we want renewal. We stick to it. I decide or I propose to the board eight years. So I will step down after eight years, what I do now. Uh, so this is for me a key element of responsible leadership to be able to step down and when I give trainings on leadership, I say, please reflect about your last day after the day of your election. You plan your stepping down at the beginning and not at the end and become an autocrat uh, for, for lifetime as we see left and right in politics, in the churches, in the religious organizations, and sometimes even in uh, uh, private universities. I come to my end, the future of globe ethics. I have 10 short sentences. I hope that globe ethics first remains faithful and strong in the core values and virtues. That's the fundamental point. Second, remains innovative 
not in the values, but in the instruments. An online library was important, but now uh, things are shifting. Maybe it's still important or we have other instruments. Third, as a global, that global ethics is a global community of people living, and that's important, unity in diversity and diversity in unity. Fourth, is engaged in resisting extremisms, violence, and polarization. And that is more important than ever. Fifth, is courageous in crossing ideological, religious, social, gender, economic, political, and military borders. More than ever, we have to be uh, have the courage to cross. When somebody uh, says, don't uh, work with the Chinese or don't work with the Americans, then we say, yes, that is an encouragement to do it against your, your limit or border. Six, give space to and is inclusive in religious spiritual depth. Seven, can increase its impact by strategic intervention on global policies in the multilateral organizations. That's what we are doing now and did during this. Uh, eight, re remain strong in its focus on ethical leadership through higher education. Even if we change our instruments, but we change not our direction like uh, changing shirts. Nine, is attractive with its vision and its solid structure for new donors who join Globethics by saying, yes, I want to substantially support and accompany this vision and wonderful community of people. That's our fundraising challenge, constant and increasing. And 10, remains a hopeful and joyful global community of people who do not give up. I believe that with this uh, direction, I'm very confident that the leadership, the board, the team, profound thanks to all uh, in the team and the regions with a new president, we will make it, you will make it. Thank you. Please stay with us a moment. Okay. Thank you, Krista. Wow, <laughs> you've laid it down for us. The pathway is clear. Um, there aren't enough numbers to count the blessings of your legacy. And there are not enough words, at least not right now. We stopped counting the minutes a while ago. Um, so we're going to pay tribute to him with a symbol. We're going to call up Obiora and also Ash Roya, our first prize winner for the Globe Ethics Leadership Award, to uh, present to you a trophy. And that will be our tribute right now. There'll be other moments. Please. Just to say a few words, thank you very, very much for the honor of carrying a gift and artwork from the African continent to bring to the youngest continent in Europe for Christoph. As we know, art is the interpretation, the manifestation of the divine in the human milieu. Art speaks in many languages. Every piece of art has a communication to make. And when the office, Fadi and Lucy informed us that Christoph started his thinking about global ethics as a young man and as a student in Kenya, that we should bring a piece of art from Africa for his exit as president. I have a school of art, young people doing things around. So we said, let's put across some ideas. What do we see? The artwork here is the African continent. You can see it is like a question mark. You can see the African continent. That is the base. But Africa is also the origin of human civilization. 
It is the land of the Australopithecus Africanus and where the Homo sapiens even started. I hope that my young Europeans will remember it. <laughs> <laughs> and what we see is the globe, which is there, but the globe is the human person. It's not just the space. And there is, of course, the artwork of the trumpet, or what we might call the triumph. Because what happens is the human being, and here you see the face of the human being. The human being is central in humanity. It is the highest, it is the person that is that which revolves, which from creation is known. So the human being is sent to shoot out an arrow. But that arrow is meant the arrow of purpose. What's your meaning? Why are you here? So there is from Africa, the human person shooting out an arrow and that arrow oscillates finding space for ethical integration. And that is why on a day like this, Christophe, the human being from Africa, he has a triumph, he has reached the apogee, and he has, and the file, that's what we call the arrow he shot, is still going on, which means globetis continues to do its work of ethical, glo globally. So this is the artwork which my people have brought. Every part of it has a, every part speaks a language. If you look at it from the behind, it's again another language. From this front, it's again another language. And what it means is that ancient wisdoms still have a space in the world of today. This gift is for Christoph, and there is a second one. The second one is this one. When you reach the age which you have reached, you become an Ogala. Ogala means Agadi. So this is now your symbol, your offer. So you can go to meet, and when anybody sees you having this, they will know you have something behind you. So this is your symbol of office, your symbol of age. It is also, it can have a light, because you can have a light. It's built on a foundation that is strong. So when you are going for meetings, like where you now put it in your hand, and then people, of course, say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> and then when you want to run, you say, no, 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 I'm no more that young. I'm now reached the age of responsibility. So these two gifts go to Christoph. We brought it all the way from Nigeria. And I want to thank you again for giving me the chance to explain the artwork. So he may give up, as he said, and we will help Christoph as he asked also to do it, but uh, not totally, because the board uh, of the foundation of Globe Ethics in its meeting on the 20th of June, 2024, decided to give the title of honorary president to Professor Christoph Stuckelberger after the end of his presidency starting 9 September, 2024, and for life due to his So this is due to his critical leadership role in founding and governing Globe Ethics, in addition to his global intellectual and public engagement for ethics. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Fadi. We've had a lot of talking. We're going to, this says looking forward. So why, why are we saying looking forward? We are looking forward, of course. But we have some words from some young people to show you. And after that, we're going to have some music. And after that, we're going to have um, a, a, the presidency handover, not forgetting the reception in the evening and um, some nice time together. So please enjoy the video and the music, and we'll see you in a short while.
and being part of Globe Ethics has allowed me to enhance my leadership capabilities, expand my professional network, and also enable me to make informed ethical decisions in my personal and professional life. Okay, so Globetic has been significantly helpful for me to study about ethics globally because I believe that ethics is not only a topic for a book or for a classroom, but it should be a catalyst for a positive change for our society. Globethics represents a place to exchange ideas, build community, and push impactful change whilst thinking about the guiding ideas which underpin our most pressing issues. To me, Globe Ethics represents a beacon of hope by helping young leaders understand their roles in bringing change through ethical leadership. So the Globe Ethics eh, me ayuda a ser una mejor líder ética, facilitando el acceso a una red global de investigadores y profesionales expertos en el tema de ética aplicada, enriqueciendo así mi capacidad de integrar los principios éticos en los distintos roles que tengo como docente, como investigadora, como ciudadana. By strengthening its position as a think tank regarding ethical considerations in emerging technologies, education, and governance, Globe Ethics can play a pivotal role in shaping a more equitable, just, and sustainable world for everyone. I hope that Globe Ethics will keep innovating in the middle of rapid social change, as well as I hope that Globe Ethics will engage more with the next generations of leaders. I hope that Globe Ethics will continue to push for truly diverse perspectives by engaging people of all different ages, sexual orientations, genders, backgrounds, and geographies. I also hope that they will continue to tackle new challenging topics like they've done with AI. Through the opportunities and the platform offered by Globe Ethics, I hope to bring change in my community, inspire other and hard voices, and influence global policy through ethical leadership and values, seeking justice for a better and sustainable future for all. Considero que Globe Ethics puede promover una visión integral de la ética aplicada, fomentando así un mundo eh, donde sus principios atraviesen todas las esferas de la sociedad de manera tangible y transformadora. Adiós. Say a secret with you to tell you who is Christoph. I can sing it, but I will just, you know, just uh, cite it. A red tie, when I first saw him 20 years ago, a red tie, white beard, twinkling his eyes, Sunday his name. He's Santa Claus. <laughs> he looks like Santa Claus. <laughs> The only, the only thing is that you just don't give gifts to us. You are our gift. So the second thing is really briefly, uh, I want to go and hug him, uh, but please don't get emotional because I'm a rock star and I want to ruin my reputation, okay? <laughs> And the story continues, of course, with uh, music. Um, you know, Globe Ethics involved me as a student. So I'm the fruit of Globe Ethics, which means that a student was involved since day one. A young person, I'm still young, okay. But yeah, a young person was involved since day one. And this is what the new president, this is what we should continue doing to involve more young people's, people on that. And uh, regarding this, I will grab again my chance about ethical responsibility and ethical leadership. Yeah, I think we need two things. One is flexibility and at least responsibility together. I came here without a guitar. The guitar was kept in Greece. Unfortunately, we don't have the, direct, the CEO of General, Geneva Airport here. <laughs> <laughs> he was yesterday. But uh, yeah, so what I had to be flexible to find the guitar and then responsible to be there and prove 
what we did with Sogol, which I knew here just 50 minutes. So we came from different environments, different cultures, different ideas, but we share common values. So I kept also, as you see here, the receipt <laughs> of the guitar will stay here forever. One, two, one, two, yeah, perfect. The song was inspired by Globe Ethics. A very short, again, story. Something that we all did. I told you, Topics, Christophe said, I started as a student. I became a professor. Just some years ago, a student sent me an email. Telling me that she came in Greece to my courses to commit suicide. But based on what she was hearing in classes, based on global ethics values, 
we saved her life. Thank you all. What a joyful moment. And I don't know how you feel, but music also gives us peace. And both Christoph and Dietrich, I know, have a strong affinity 
with music. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed attendees, friends and companions of Globe Ethics. It is my distinct honor and pleasure to now introduce you to our new Globe Ethics president, Professor Dietrich Werner. We have all witnessed in this anniversary ceremony how important it is to have a foundational vision, to be able to nurture this vision and to share it with as many as possible. Christoph Stückelberger's vision has been and remains a contagious one, one that he shared graciously with others and one that others adopted readily and made it their own. Dietrich Werner's story of ethical leadership connects perfectly to Globe Ethics foundational story. The world is as small or as wide as your imagination. It is this imagination, the ability to see the world with ever fresh eyes and to engage with the world as it is and how it should be that characterizes ethical leaders. Our new president Dietrich Werner is such a personality. He has made his engagement with the world, the encounter with people of different backgrounds, cultures, beliefs and worldviews, a commitment of a lifetime. Dietrich hails from the Northern part of Germany, but he studied in the world first in Germany at the universities of Göttingen, Tübingen, and then he went abroad to Edinburgh. He returned to Bielefeld in Germany, Geneva, Bosse. He earned his doctorate in 1993, supervised by one of the leading personalities in the ecumenical movement, the former general secretary of the World Council of Churches, Professor Konrad Reiser a mentor who undoubtedly shaped not only his academic expertise and interest in the major ethical questions of our time. Dietrich is an ordained minister of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Northern Germany and has occupied in his career of nearly 40 years, several prestigious positions, gained numerous distinctions and awards even though he would himself never venture into details of his professional achievements and accolades. Keep it really short, he whispered to me yesterday evening. He mentioned, um, uh, to mention these nevertheless is more than a formality. Professor Werner brings extensive qualifications in ecumenical relations to bear for his new role. He first became a junior lecturer at the University of uh, Bochum, went then to, as a visiting professor to the United Theological College in Bangalore in India, and became then from 1993 to 2000, head of studies at the Academy of Missions in Hamburg a period in which I met him for the first time and had a wonderful time of collegiality. I saw Dietrich's passion from the outset for understanding and for helping the students understand their own contexts, for discovering their agency in transforming their communities and to find their own voices in articulating hopes and aspirations for a world in which differences would be respected while advancing the awareness for the way in which people can live together peacefully. A theme which never left him to this day. And I know that he thoroughly enjoyed the reflections and conversations at this Global Ethics Forum on peace, policymaking, and the contributions of religious communities, as these are at the heart of his concern. 
Dietrich then pursued his career as executive director for ecumenical education and research at a mission, a mission agency in Northern Germany from 2000 to 2007. He became thereafter the program executive for ecumenical theological education of the World Council of Churches from 2007 to 2014, and also in this period, co-founder of Globe Theolib, the global digital library for theology and ecumenism. From 2021 to 2023, he was a senior research fellow of the Humboldt University in Berlin and dedicated his attention to religious communities and sustainable development. And from 2014 to 2023, he became a honorary professor in intercultural theology at Germany's uh, University of Applied Sciences for Intercultural Theology. His last position prior to his retirement was as head of the unit on theology, ecumenical relations and conceptual dialogue of Bread for the World, the German Protestant Development Agency, the largest Christian NGO in Europe with more than 580 members, staff members in Germany and abroad. However, the list would be incomplete without referring to Dietrich Wenner's exquisite and prolific authorship. A series of handbooks, um, I just hint to the wonderful Regnum studies in global Christianity on precisely Christianity in different contexts of the world are not only reference works in his discipline and indicative of the breadth of his academic expertise, but also of his fine collegiality the capacity to build trustful relationships with colleagues internationally and to translate the insights he gained from these intercultural conversations into every working relationships he engages in. We have this proverb in our context that knowledge is like a baobab tree, one arm alone does not suffice to embrace it and Dietrich epitomizes um, this ethos of collegiality and relationship building. In recent years, he placed an increased attention to build partnerships across academia, public and private sectors, and reaching out to international non-governmental organizations and to governmental agencies as well, and also to associations in higher education. His membership in international learned bodies, advisory councils have led him not only to travel the world, foster strong relationships with networks in all regions of the world, but earned him the recognition of all those who have the privilege to work with him. Professor Venice's recent official retirement from his uh, role at uh, Bread for the World in 2023 is not indicative of any withdrawal from the fields of engagement he has distinguished himself in. He remains as involved and dedicated to transform the realities of the world in which he lives. He wants to build bridges, intellectual bridges, but most importantly, relational bridges to people of diverse societal sectors, to organizations and movements. With Dietrich Werner, globe ethics will be enriched and undoubtedly gains a bridge builder, a gifted human being, a personality who has preserved a genuine curiosity in life, unpretentious and turned toward all humans in consideration and with whom he is determined to build a better world. Please join me now to welcome on stage our new incoming president, Professor Dietrich Werner. And may I also invite 
our current president, Professor Stickelberger. And we will now proceed to um, a kind of a ritual action and maybe you can forward so that everyone can see you. Every ceremony of this uh, kind and handover deserves a kind of a ritual action. And you have heard from Christoph earlier on that he received this wonderful stole from Indonesia. And uh, this is now the moment um, when uh, Christoph will um, symbolically um, hand over um, to you um, Dietrich um, and pass on this toll to you. This is the moment. <laughs> Please remain. I now invite uh, first our vice president, uh, Professor Divya Singh, to come on stage, as well as our vice president, Professor Diki Sofian, to join as well on stage. We would like to make visible also the members of our board and our Globe Ethics leadership. And I also invite uh, Isabel Sommer of Lindsay Foundation to join us. I don't know if Mr. André Schneider, board member, is present. Then I invite him also cordially to join us. Professor Marie-Laure Sal seems no longer to be there. Um, Professor Asha Kanwa, please. And two other board members are joining us online. Dr. Pavan Dugal from India and Professor Rudolf von Zinner, Brazil. And I invite also Professor Obiora Ike to join us and I end with Professor Ike because he has a special surprise for our incoming president. And so I asked him to kindly come forward and to proceed. We are talking about He's art, <laughs> about art and the impact of art. One of Africa's most ancient countries is Ethiopia. And you may know about the story of Ethiopia. Don't forget that Solomon, in history books, invited the queen of Shaaba to visit him far back 1,000 years, even earlier, before the Bible was written, the modern, modern ones. And the Ethiopians have a deep Christian, let us say, um, history, but also a land where Muslim and everything crosses, African cultures also. So landing in Addis Ababa, and I was also asked to find a gift which will symbolize what the new president is going to carry on his burden or his task. Um, Amele has just presented him um, in his theological background, his educational and so on and so forth. So Dietrich, something that fits you best is that you are going to carry the cross. <laughs> um, um, so noblesse oblige, that's what the French say, nobility obliges. So this is the cross you are going to carry as president. And um, Christoph carried it symbolically, quietly in many other ways, but we want now to show it to you. Am I supposed to give it to him now? I thought it was. So on behalf of all members of the board, you are going to carry the cross that not alone, the board will help you to carry it. Dear Christoph, dear Vice Presidents, Vicky Zofian and Divya Singh, dear members of the board, dignitaries, academic colleagues, and strategic partners. It is indeed an immense privilege for me to present to you four short considerations on the future of globe ethics, 
Let's make the best of the fast running time at this solemn and joyful occasion. First one, a world out of balance and the search for common ethical values. This world is out of balance. It is in disarray and increased polarization. Still, we cannot give up the search for common ethical values. That was a key conviction which opened the introductory chapters of your opus magnum, dear Christoph, Global Balance for a New World Order. Two years after its second edition was published in 2022, we still find ourselves in an extraordinary multifaceted global crisis, a world out of balance. This assessment is echoed and repeated by a recent key global UNEP report, United Nations Environmental Program from July, Navigating New Horizons, a global foresight report on planetary health and human well-being. The, the report worth reading by all of you presents insights on eight critical shifts, global shifts presented in 18 signals of change that are accelerating the triple planetary crisis of climate change, biodiversity and nature loss, as well as pollution and waste. The challenges of a world out of balance, or what some in another report have even called a world adrift, a world without navigation, are also behind another key document from the UN, which is currently heavily discussed and will be on the table during the New York UN Summit for the Future, just in a few weeks from now. The second draft document of the UN Pact for the Future, which tragically and surprisingly is without a proper chapter on the role of values, religions, and ethics for the future. We hope that the UN will complement their Pact for the Future with a proper statement on the role of values, religions, and ethics for the future. We could help with this. Anyhow, in the second draft document for the UN Pact for the Future, this Globe Ethics Forum was citing this document with the following clause, and I quote, we are at the moment of acute global peril. Humanity faces a range of potentially catastrophic and existential risks. Why this is so? We all know factors behind, just to name six of them very briefly. Climate change, still causes severe disruptions. Just images, droughts in Brazil, dying fishes in Greece and Volos, many other pictures come to our mind. Secondly, the collective security system, which was developed after World War II, seems to be replaced by a dominance of might over right. Military and economic power count more than mutually agreed legal frameworks, binding treaties, and democratic procedures. Fourth one, multilateralism and politics and the promotion of cultures of mu mutual responsibility are waning alongside an eroding consensus that commitment to strong engagement and development cooperation is a must for a politics grounded in human rights and democracy for all. And Germany plays uh, not an easy role in this regard currently. Geopolitical tensions and regional military conflicts are rising and continue protracted without being sufficiently controlled and contained. And the last one, people are seeking refuge, as has been mentioned several times during our Globe Ethics Forum, in populist, in extremist, or autocratic political, uh, political orientations which are spreading like an infectious disease. The inner cohesion of societies and their middle spectrum thus suffers and continues to be weakened at the expense of polarization between the political extremes. How can we then achieve a new world order which is inspired by common ethical values different from the old answers of rigid nationalism, mutual nuclear deterrence, military escalations, economic protectionism, and my country first survival strategies, which we know will work in the long run only at the expense of future generations and at the expense of the ecological integrity of the earth as a whole. How can we achieve a more balanced and more inclusive system of value-based commitments 
for multilateral responsibility. This has been the key question behind your book, Low Balance for a New World Order, and both your immense work on interreligious and global ethics in the past decades, as well behind the 20 years of history of global ethics, which has just been recollected in the session before. With these days here during the Global Ethics Forum, we want to position or reposition the work of this organization in the most important collective search process, processes for new political and ethical orientations in the current global poly crisis as expressed in some of the studies referred to above. Ethics, that is our common conviction, is more than a collection of statements with good intentions, ultimate ends, or general moral principles. Ethics needs to face contextual realities on the ground, the ambivalences involved in having to make difficult choices between different options. Ethics needs to spell out the implications of responsibilities in translating good intentions into possible individual and common actions for good and for just and appropriate choices and into common legal and regulatory frameworks. In your book, Low Balance Towards a New uh, World Order, I found one key sentence which will help us to continue the institutional and personal legacy in this new period for Globe Ethics. And I quote, we need binding rules, regulations, standards, and law enforcement based on strong value base. We are convinced that individual ethics, interpersonal ethics, and institutional ethics are all needed but institutionalized ethics in forms of global, regional, and national rules and laws are critical. Institutional ethics are not unilaterally declared or imposed, but negotiated in fair processes and implemented with power, with incentives, and with sanctions." End of quote. And I come to my second small point. We need institutionalized ethics, the value and the potential of globe ethics. The deep concern to qualify, to strengthen institutionalized ethics and the connection between ethics and international law is at the heart of my own vision and commitment. We learned again during this forum that law is the servant of ethics. The city of Geneva, which has been rightly called the capital of global ethics with our organization as a privileged instrument to provide a platform for has a particular historic role in pro promoting the connection between ethics and international humanitarian law, like it happened during the Geneva Conventions, the original first one from 1848, involved in the International Committee of the Red Cross and its formation on the protected of wounded soldiers, and then the advanced four Geneva Conventions concerning the protection of civilians in wars from 1949. I am convinced we need more Geneva Conventions on Ethics. For instance, the whole issue of digitization of warfare and war technology and the use of AI in actually warfare and the future of world peace, much is needed and was discussed during this forum these days. Strengthening networks of institutionalized ethics today can become a crucial remedy, I believe, against the growing loss of orientation and social cohesion in the world adrift, as well as against the polarization in our societies. During the Globe Ethics Forum, we have listened to a vast cloud of more than 60 witnesses and voices in a rich and diverse panorama of international experts contributing with their expertise. We have strengthened institutionalized ethics by promoting the launch of the 24 Global Survey on Business Ethics as well as an important policy report on ethical leadership in the age of AI. We have visibly seen that Globe Ethics is and remains part of a widening, a vast and strengthened global network of important partners, many of which have similar goals and visions. I invite all of them to support us in the ongoing journey to deliver further substantial and visible formats of institutional ethics and the invitation explicitly is extended to all religious traditions as well as to non-religious actors and contributors in ethical regards. What has been achieved already by Globe Ethics to a significant extent in the field of business ethics and ethics of AI, we hope to deliver together 
also in the other fields mentioned by our strategic agenda, namely peace ethics and environmental and sustainability ethics, all related to common standards and courses and training for ethics in higher education. The world strongly needs ethical leadership in this moment of a global poly crisis. I firmly believe that our organization is uniquely positioned to fulfill this mandate and to contribute a distinct space for transformational thought leadership in world ethics, as it has four unique core competencies, my famous four special Cs. Globe ethics has an outstanding, that is the first one, convening power, both in the international context of Geneva, as well as globally, bringing together a wide field of actors, INGOs, higher education institutions with their different belief systems and ethical approaches, but all united as people of goodwill and with a common sense of value orientation. Globe ethics secondly has a special convincing power as it is the power of sharp minds, of critical arguments, which counts here in the field of ethics, not the power of might, the power of money or mass manipulation. Globe ethics certainly has a significant communication power as it has developed a highly sophisticated digital knowledge sharing system accessible for those less advantaged, which aims to be relevant and strong with the most advanced systems of communicating to circles of opinion leaders, both in higher education and politics in diplomacy business and interreligious dialogue. Finally, Globe Ethics has an exceptional cooperation power as we also observed during this forum as it has built up not only strong relational and cooperative links with the Geneva landscapes of NGO and university education like the Maison de la Paix here, but also the network of its various regional centers in countries of the global south, many of which luckily are here today, and also the network of its national contexts. I think it will be a crucial task for the months ahead to unearth, to revitalize and to strengthen this potential, this tremendous potential of Globe Ethics for enhancing working processes on ethics in regions and in different national contexts. A big task for us ahead. The third section on my understanding of visionary and transformative leadership, to cut it a bit short. Not to forget, Globe Ethics has a dedicated and highly qualified team an exceptionally committed executive director with whom I'm looking forward to be in very close dialogue. And to turn a bit more personally at this stage, how do I see my particular role as a new president? In the process leading to this request to provide leadership for Globe Ethics, I certainly have sometimes asked myself, who am I to provide leadership for this massive project and foundation? In my brief acceptance response, then in June this year to the board, I had stated, and I quote, as the new president-elect, I stand before you with a sense of humbleness, also awe and respect for the enormous work this foundation has done already in past years and which lies ahead and also for the confidence put in me. But I'm also filled with a sense of determination and fresh commitment to accept this huge responsibility in a spirit of servanthood, of solidarity, and the new enthusiasm for what we can achieve together, end of quote. I think I still use some of the same keywords, humbleness, respect, sincere listening, good collegiality, to describe my attitude for entering into this role. At the same time, I think my role should particularly be marked by a sense of visionary and transformative leadership as we are really in a critical period of transition. Globe ethics probably will not be the same in five years from now. And I might invite all of you in a little exercise after I have finished to turn to your neighbor and just share your own vision, your own ideas. What do you think Globe Ethics is going to look like or should look like in five or 10 years from now? We need to learn and to live with transition because the environment in which we are working are changing so rapidly. To live with transition starts with the president. I cannot be another Christoph Stückelberger as I am a different person, but certainly I bring with me into this new role decades of involvement in the international ecumenical movement, ecumenical social thought, development ethics discourses and intensive years of theological publishing, 
engagement secondly in national and international discourses on the intersection between religion and development, the involvement in international initiatives to strengthen excellency on higher education, and particularly a deep passion and a personal passion to contribute to the empowerment of younger generations of ethical leaders. And certainly, finally, an involvement with international networks for international, for interreligious dialogue. Thus, I am not alone, but part of a multi-regional and multi-religious team consisting of one president from Europe background, but two well-experienced vice presidents, one from Asia and one from Africa. And I'm convinced that we present together with the director from Middle East, a very strong leadership team for Globe Essex for the years ahead. My vision for Globe Essex and its future might be spelled out in the four E's very briefly. Empowerment for youth and for women, for an ethics of respect. Ethics of respect would be in the center of my vision for Globe Essex. Ethics of respect for different traditions, for different cultural traditions, as well as religious traditions. Ethics of respect for each human being, for human dignity. Ethics of respect for animals. Ethics of respect for our precious nature. Second E, Education, education, education. That is what counts in the training for ethical and responsible leadership. We need more formation of qualified future leaders and education is the key to it that had been stated several times. Third E, environmental and ecological ethics. Environmental ethics, planetary ethics, as we would call it in our discourses, is at the center and that has to be related to both health ethics peace ethics, business, and economic ethics. And finally, energizing, energizing and widening our circles, energizing also to attract additional funding and wider working coalitions, which we need to work for. Our common tasks and challenges are indeed enormous in the board, my dear colleagues, particularly with regard to securing long-term funding and adapting to rapidly changing contexts. The institutional and educational landscapes and the context in which we are operating are changing at an ever increasing speed. What is our unique character, our USP for what we can and what we should offer? We need to achieve highest and enduring impact with might be smaller means and limited staff. How to prioritize then? That is a question we have to deal with. Ethics, I believe, has its price like higher education of the future leaders in economy, politics, and science has its price. Cheap and shallow or sloganizing ethics is not work worth any effort. For ethics to be impactful, capable to be communicated to leaders, fit for organizing new majorities in societies and sustainable in the long run, it needs high quality standards of best, younger, and critical minds for visionary leadership. While we all owe an immense word of gratitude and recognition to Lindsay Foundation, which has faithfully accompanied Globe Essex in the first two decades as funding partners, we also need to state clearly, Globe Essex needs additional sources of funding for the years to come, particularly after 2027. In a world where we observe an unprecedented accumulation of private wealth, it would be a scandal if we would not manage to attract some of the existing enormous Global Essex for building a comprehensive, ethical frameworks for some of the most burning challenges we are facing in the world today. Serious neglect of long-term global investment into ethical leadership development will result in a much higher price to be paid by societies and governments in the end, in terms of the consequences of the absence of global ethical standards and commitments for the social fabric for peace and for justice. Therefore, it is important to invest into the infrastructure, the staff, and strategic work of a leading think tank on ethics like Globe Ethics. I come to my final point, Globe Ethics, Globe Balance in the work of Globe Ethics. So Globe Balance, the term which was created by Christoph, is not only needed for the new world order, but also it is needed for the work within Globe Ethics. And I might just like to bring to your attention that the future development of Globe Ethics should be marked by four crucial balances, according to my understanding. Balances between 
continuity and innovation, balances between regional outreach and global strategic partnership, balances between our own distinct profile and wider alliances in the field between face-based and interface actors, balances between sustained and stable core funding lines and short-term project funds by additional funding partners. I have explained all of this in some more lines, but I think I need to cut it short now because uh, running of time and I come to a very short post loot. I do what I can. Let me close with a little humoristic piece and narrative, which is cited here from a very important speech made in Aachen, in the Aachener Dome last year by the Austrian writer Robert Menasse, an essayist, a scholar, a literary critique, Born in Vienna, 1954, has lived and worked in Brazil, Austria, Sri Lanka. His works translated into more than 20 major languages. His lecture there in Aachen was under the remarkable title, Faith in Europe, a Sermon. And it was a passionate plea against the re-emerging of the spirit of rigid and narrow-minded nationalisms, which is threatening the closure and the falling down of the beautiful European sky on the horizon with all its radiating stars and opportunities. So at the end of this remarkable lecture from June last year worth reading, he shares a short fairy tale, which I want to cite here at the end. There is a sparrow lying on the ground in a forest clearing under a gray sky. He lies on his back and stretches his legs up in the air. A tomcat then comes, sees the sparrow, and is amazed. He doesn't think, this is easy prey for me now. Or maybe he still has done. But the cat first wants to understand this unusual behavior of the bird. And so the cat asks, why are you, an animal of the air, lying here on the ground and stretching your little legs up? The sparrow replies, you may not have noticed it yet, but the sky is threatening to fall down on all of us. The cat has to laugh. And you think if you lie there and lift your little legs towards the sky that you can prevent that? I don't think so, says the sparrow, says the sparrow but I will do what I can. Did the tomcat then eat the bird? He was amazed on this answer. He was so confused that he trolled himself away. He thought for a long time this, I am doing what I can, couldn't get out of his head. And so one day, the tomcat decided to go back to the spot where he had seen the sparrow to see if it was still there lies and stretches his thin little legs in the air. He didn't find him anymore, but he met a lamb lying next to the wolf in the sunny clearing. And the sky was big and blue and white, and it was still there. End of the story. Am I doing what I can in order to stem the tide. Are we doing all what we can to prevent the open sky of opportunities from a catastrophic falling down on all of us to build up resilience over against destructive forces in this world and to invent like this little sparrow, little acts of hope and of non-conformity against the inertia around us, around us. If we all do what we can, each on his or her place, then globe ethics will still remain to be a global family, and I use these words from Lawrence Chong, a global family of creative ethical change makers, and globe ethics will be alive for years to come, and humanity hopefully will do better. I thank you for your attention.